preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. My name is Robert Gilson, and it's my privilege to direct the School of the Arts here. Um, before I begin this evening, um, I'd like to thank uh, Gilda and Henry Block um, for graciously underwriting this lecture. Um, we're truly most grateful for their generosity and support. Um, to paraphrase William Blake in The Auguries of Innocence, to see the world in a grain of sand, a self-portrait in an aspirin. Um, if you're here to see Thomas Friedman, um, the Pulitzer Prize winning New York <laughs> Times columnist, um, he was here in January, January 24th to be exact, so you're late. Um, <laughs> The name of this series is Artist Visions. This is the final lecture um, in this year's series, and it's with Tom Friedman, uh, the extraordinary artist. And we're really pleased to have him here this evening. The moderator for Artist Visions is Robert Storr. Uh, Mr. Storr is a senior curator, curator in the Department of uh, Painting and Sculpture at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Among the many exhibitions he has curated for MoMA are included retrospectives of Chuck Close, Tony Smith, Willem de Kooning, um, a retrospective exhibition of the work of Gerhard Richter currently on view at MoMA as Mr. Storr's uh, most recent contribution to the field. And um, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's an, it's an extraordinary contribution. Um, a prolific author, Mr. Storr has written monographs by Philip Guston, Chuck Close, Louise Bourgeois. Um, his most re recent monograph is for Philip Perlstein since 1983. Um, and by the way, um, there is an interview in um, this book um, that uh, actually is, was transcribed from an Artist Visions lecture here at the Y. So we're very glad um, and proud to be um, part of, um, part of that, that incredibly beautiful monograph. Um, Mr. Storr is a contributing editor uh, at Art in America, among other publications. His criticism appears regularly in Art Forum, Parquet, and The Village Voice. A frequent lecturer, Mr. Storr has taught painting, drawing, art history, and criticism at numerous colleges and art schools in the US and abroad. Um, the format for this evening will be as follows. Um, Mr. Storr will be out briefly to introduce Mr. Friedman. Um, then Mr. Friedman will come out and speak about his work, show slides. Um, at the end of the slides, Mr. Friedman will join uh, Mr. Storr on stage. They'll have a conversation about Mr. Friedman's work and ideas. And at the end of that, um, there will be an opportunity for questions. And um, without any further ado, um, welcome. And please help me to welcome Robert Storr. Thank you. Hi. Um, uh, Bob used the quote from Blake, which had occurred to me, uh, and it's a good one. Um, I had also thought of another expression, which is to make a mountain out of a molehill, which is generally something that's disadvised. Um, on the other hand, it's a pretty good idea. Um, and certain people know how to make mountains out of molehills in interesting ways, and the artist we're going to have this evening has made not literally that, but many things out of commonplace materials that have uh, truly vast um, proportions to them and also many ideas attached. Now I'd like to do something which I have, I think, never done before and in a certain way my job at a museum prohibits me from doing, uh, but to give uh, fair credit to an art dealer. Um, church and state are not supposed to meet in most cases like this, even though we interdepend a good deal. Um, but there is in uh, the city a man named Hudson who runs a gallery called Feature Gallery, uh, which is the place where I first encountered Tom Friedman's work. Uh, and it's an extraordinary operation in the sense that he uh, has created a gallery which is not the, the kind of gallery we have mostly in the city, or if not mostly, that is most paid attention to, which are the vast big galleries for uh, the sort of prominent uh, grand display of works of art. Uh, it has at various times been one room, two rooms, three rooms, all of them small. Uh, and very often, a given exhibition is really one or two or three artists, not one artist three times. Um, I was reminded, for example, at the beginning of the 1980s, there was a time when on West Broadway, uh, you weren't serious in the art world unless you had not only one West Broadway gallery, but two. 
and maybe even something over on Green Street. Um, Hudson works by almost inverse proportion, which in the case of this artist who loves to play with scale is the right thing. Um, he shows exactly the right amount of a given kind of work in exactly the right place, and adjacent to it is something else. Uh, and when I first encountered Tom's work, it was in this context. It was, in fact, a self-portrait uh, carved out of uh, a, an aspirin tablet. Uh, and uh, a variety of other things which you will see in slide forms. Um, the reason I mention it is that often things get overlooked because the package they're in is not the package you're looking for. Uh, it takes a, a certain refinement, in a sense, to be able to make the right presentation, the right frame for a certain kind of artwork. Uh, and I think that it is very important to, to recognize not only what Hudson himself has done, but what a lot of dealers now do in Queens, uh, in the, the, the uh, nether floors of the buildings of Chelsea, uh, and so on and so forth, where a lot of the freshest work comes to us without the, the, the grand scale. Um, in the case, as I said, of Tom Friedman, what he's dealing with very often is issues of scale, uh, perceptions of it in the literal sense, but also the poetics of scale. Uh, and I would say in this sense that uh, my introduction to him, which was in this little tiny small room of even smaller things, and that I later brought uh, to the modern in an early project show that I did, uh, a project show where suddenly the early, little tiny room with which we were always having to make do in projects seemed about the right size. Um, but this is, in a sense, an optic one can take as one begins to look at uh, what he does. So uh, without further ado, one of the very most interesting artists around, period, Tom Friedman. Thank you, Rob. Do these lights come down a little? Thank you. Um, I'm uh, just going to talk about my work from what I see as a very clear beginning for it. Um, it started in graduate school. I came to um, graduate school at University of Illinois in um, Chicago not knowing really very much about contemporary art. I came to this program doing large charcoal drawings that were um, uh, similar to Thomas Hart Benton and um, was confronted with a way of talking about and um, thinking about them which totally paralyzed me. Um, I didn't I had no idea where this new language and new way of looking at art was coming from. So I'm the type of person who likes to um, simplify as a way of figuring something out. After many futile attempts at trying to simplify my work, um, I came back realizing I needed to simplify my environment. I needed to find a new beginning. Um, so I. I um, came back to school and removed everything from my studio, boarded up the, spent about a month just creating this pristine white void. Uh, this is a slide of that space, which, uh, and that's my mom. Um, I was looking for like a, a beginning, a way of understanding nothing before I could begin doing something. Um, Every day for about a month, I would bring an object and place it somewhere in this, uh, in this uh, room, sit down and think about this object. Um, one, the, the, the first day, I remember, I brought a metronome and placed the metronome in the middle of the floor, and it would click back and forth. And I would think about that. Next day, I brought a plate and placed it on the floor. I started to gather um, and accumulate a bunch of questions, questions, very basic questions that I could ask about the, these objects. Um, I then started to categorize those objects, um, which I then made into a questionnaire, uh, which turned out to be about 20 pages long of, of very basic questions that I could ask about these objects, like what, it, what is it, what is it made out of, um, where does it come from, uh, why was it made, why is it here. 
This is the first page of that questionnaire. Um, one day, uh, I poured honey on the floor, brought honey and poured it on the floor, and it settled into a puddle in the center of my studio. And when I was away from this um, this space, someone asked me if I had urinated on the floor. They thought the puddle of honey looked like urine. And after hearing that, it just sort of propelled me sort of outside of myself, looking at my activity of, of what I was doing in this uh, space. So I thought about other metaphors to describe what I was doing. The idea of piecing something together came to me. I could envision myself um, pouring a bunch of uh, pieces, uh, getting a jigsaw puzzle, pouring the pieces on the um, floor, and my activity would be making this puzzle. So I, um, I went to the store, got a jigsaw puzzle, and proceeded to do that. It wasn't until I was almost finished with the puzzle that I um, figured that I would separate the pieces maybe about an inch to a uh, uh, three quarters of an inch uh, apart from each other so that it was made but it was just sort of stretched out. This is a, a slide of the puzzle. Um, this is a detail shot. And that seemed to do something for me. It, it, uh, um, I was looking for, with this studio, I was looking for something that I could know, something that, that was sort of irrefutable to me. And this was getting closer to that. I've, um, I, I was looking for something that was very simple and, and very direct. Um, at, a, at about this time, I was involved in meditation. And I saw a similarity between um, the meditation that I was doing, this idea of uh, trying to simplify and this activity, this art activity. So I thought about um, doing something that sort of represented that meditative process. The idea of erasing came to mind. Um, I collected, spent hundreds of hours collecting eraser shavings um, in a jar, which I then sprinkled onto the floor of this uh, studio space into a soft edge circle. This is a slide of that. Um, and this was getting closer to that idea of, of simplicity and, and focus um, that I was trying to get at. I identified through this piece um, four basic elements that I would then work with for a while. That was the material that I would choose, the uh, process for transforming the material, the form that that process would create, and then the presentation of that form. And then I was looking for also for ways of connecting those, those elements together, trying to create some type of circular logic, um, such as the erasing uh, um, with the eraser shavings, um, producing this uh, focal point, and the, the idea of meditation and a focal point. This is a uh, made out of laundry detergent. I made it. Um, by creating a funnel with a, pen, uh, a, a pendulum that was, cr uh, that was uh, constructed of a funnel um, and a string. I filled it with the detergent and then tossed it in a circular path, um, and it created this, uh, this form. Um, I would look into the objects that I was ma tr making, trying to extract ideas from it. And the idea of uh, the, the fact that it was a cleaning material um, made sense to me. I liked the, the fact that it was, uh, that it was part of a daily ritual of, of um, cleaning ourselves. And um, I liked the connection between that and uh, more spiritual rituals for um, um, spiritual purification. Um, with that in mind of looking for cleaning materials, I was in the shower and a piece of hair, of my, my hair got stuck on a bar of soap. 
And I looked at it and I saw it as something that was very beautiful. Um, at the time, it wasn't enough for me to just present it as this happening. It, um, I needed to ritualize my process um, more with it. So I, I did this piece, which is uh, my pubic hair inlaid into a bar of soap. I was thinking of these things as meditative objects. I wanted them to be as compressed and condensed as, as they could. The, the thought of doing something that had a clear objective would intensify that compression where I would have a designated amount of material and the process would have a clear objective, a beginning and an end point. Um, I came to this piece, piece which is a, a roll of toilet paper that I re-rolled as precisely as I could um, and uh, the cardboard tube was uh, removed. A friend of mine told me about how children learn to blow spit bubbles. And I had been dealing with these geometric forms in my work. So that the idea of this as something that the body, this, uh, um, that the body can create this spherical form, this perfect form was interesting to me. So I had my father take a uh, photograph of me blowing a spit bubble. And I liked the, uh, um, after I did it, I liked the, uh, how the facial expression was one of creating the spit bubble, but also of um, um, wonder and discovery. The way my thinking was going at the time um, was still kind of looking for the, this, these basic um, um, principles. So the thought of prime, uh, the, uh, I would go through my head like primary, basic, base, regressive, that sort of chain of ideas. So um, I th was thinking about regressing or regression. Um, I looked for materials that had to do more uh, to do more with an oral process, um, and I did this piece, which is about 1,500 pieces of bubble gum that I chewed and then molded it into a sphere. Um, I wasn't quite sure how to present, present it. Um, it didn't seem to work on the floor or on a pedestal. Um, then it came to me to wedge it in the corner, so I wedged it in the corner and it hangs by the stickiness of the gum. Um, and that seemed to make sense as the corner being something that's uh, associated with punishment. And um, also that the corner is some architectural um, device for drawing one into sort of a focal point. This is a roll of lifesavers in which each consecutive one is sucked a little more. The idea, um, with, with the idea of regression, um, unlearning came to mind. So I did this piece, which is a school chair that I drilled um, a lot of holes into, and it started to fall apart. But there was this teetering back and forth between it sort of decaying or becoming, it being this uh, vandalous act in a way, but also it almost looking like a sponge. Uh, I made, this is a pencil shaving, which I made by putting a pencil through a pencil sharpener, and it hangs by a nail. I, I think of a pencil not so much referring to, to um, drawing, but more to language, writing language, and the idea of this looking like a, um, like a drill bit. So I was looking for ways of drawing people's attention to these everyday materials. 
um, and looking for trying to figure out strategies for drawing people in. And uh, the idea of labor um, was, was a factor in that. The more that I would spend um, doing something I felt would um, um, create a more sympathetic audience to these things. This is uh, a pile of pillow stuffing. It took me about two years to do. I, I took the um, um, stuffing out of a pillow and separated strand by strand into the pile. I then started to look more at the, at the viewer and th was thinking about what it, what it is that the viewer brings to an, an art experience, and that is expectation. So the idea of downplay came to mind um, as a way of lowering one, someone's expectations, but if they were to investigate that that their expectation would sort of flip, um, um, where they're expecting something very casual, and when they investigate and they find out the labor involved, that it would um, sort of intensify their, their discovery. This is a, a pile of pickup sticks. It's actually two piles. One I tossed on the floor, and then the other I duplicated. I, I, um, I duplicated the first pile. Um, it's radially symmetrical. This is a detail shot. You can see where the symmetry comes together at the green pickup sticks. This is a piece of paper poked by a pin as many times as possible without ripping the paper apart, and it's hung by the pin that poked it. I then started to look more at the materials uh, and uh, the physicality of the materials uh, as a way of defining a form, um, thinking about the limits of the material. Uh, this piece is made with about 3,000 garbage bags, one inside of another inside of another, until I couldn't put any more garbage bags over, over it. Um, so it's as full as it can be, and it weighs about 300 pounds. There's a pile of string. There's no armature inside, it's just a pile of string. Thinking about the, the uh, limits um, of material sorry, to, uh, led me to think about the limits of a material's existence and fragility. Um, something almost being there or being there and, and the, the, the fragility of it. Um, thinking about uh, 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 an art experience of a, of a grand scale and the presence that that um, um, creates versus um, something that's very fragile, and how when something's fragile, you sort of internalize the the um, you f you feel it in your in your um, body the the fragility of it, um, and thinking about that as a as a type of presence. I did this piece, which is a piece of wire. It's it's hard to um, photograph this. It's a piece of wire that I stuck into the middle of the floor. And then I started to straighten it out, and it would fall over, and then I would cut it down a little and straighten it out some more. And I kept cutting it down and straightening it out to find the exact point at which it can support itself. And it would be so fragile, it would quiver with the slightest uh, air um, vibrations. Uh, this is sort of a detail of how it would be presented. It needs to have a, um, a guard around it at all times because you can't really see it. <laughs> I thought about the smallest 
amount of material that I could present that would have the most significance. Um, um, the, the idea, uh, so I did this piece, which is uh, um, on a cube 20 by 20 by 20, um, is um, a speck, a half a millimeter in diameter of my feces, um, which is on the, whoops, which is on the very center top of the um, pedestal cube. And it wasn't about the, um, the, the, the disgust of the, um, of the feces. It was about um, using this material. And, and as it got smaller, it's like a, a focal point. As something gets smaller, like an, on a magnifying glass, when you um, have shine light through a magnifying glass or sh let the sun go through a magnifying glass, when it gets the, when the, 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 the light gets smaller and smaller, it, it can um, like burn a hole in a, um, a piece of paper or, or something. Um, it was that, that kind of bringing something to that type of focal point. Um, and there being a, uh, a point at which, I was thinking about the point at which the idea and the presence and the, the material presence sort of became one and the same. Um, I heard about the space shuttle going up into space and it would uh, carry with it um, some stamps that on its return would become collector's items. So I thought about this stamp that went up in, into space and an identical stamp that didn't next to each other, and one would have this value attached to it um, more than the other, even though they were um, atomic, atonim, um, subatomically identical. So I thought about this idea of attaching a history to something um, uh, at, and how this history, um, attaching it to, would change one's experience of it once they discovered that history. Some information that was separate from the visual experience. So I did this piece, which is titled Hot Balls. Usually my pieces aren't titled. Um, I, I use a title more as a clue or um, information. Uh, this piece is titled Hot Balls, which is a collection of toy and game balls that I stole from um, various stores um, in Chicago when I was living there. When I was doing this, I was collecting all these smaller balls, and I wasn't quite sure how to finish this piece. And then I was in a Walgreens, and I saw one of this big red ball, and I thought I'd take that, and um, <laughs> I would arrange it and have that on the top as the prize. Um, with the idea of attaching history, I did this piece. Um, also, the, the idea of uh, um, um, materials existence and, and trying to find a way of presenting something that, that was or wasn't there. Um, so I um, took this pedestal to a witch <clears throat> and gave the witch specific instructions to curse a spherical space that's, um, it's an 11 inch spherical space that's 11 inches above the pedestal. Um, and it was interesting, the, the idea of how um, one's belief defines sort of the reality of, of something and how one's belief defined the existence of it. If someone believes that it's there, it's there. If someone doesn't, it's not. Um, a logical progression from thinking about simplicity was to um, start to think about complexity. So I did this drawing, or the following drawing. This is a diagram of the following drawing, which is, um, one second here. Um, the drawing begins with a point and then a vector from that point, and that's number one, and then 
two vectors divide from that, and those are number two. Um, and these vectors are um, an eighth of an inch shorter than the first one. And then these vectors divide, and they're number three, then number four. And that turns to that. Um, it's kind of uh, becomes very much about fractals. That it starts turning in on itself. And I was interested to how this very basic process of dividing um, created this type of complexity. Um, with the idea of complexity and information um, and ha um, how um, the inundation of information um, as information um, is travels faster, that the texture of it becomes um, more apparent than the, the, than the um, bits of information that are actually um, being presented. Uh, that led me to this piece, which is titled Everything, on which I wrote all the words in the English language on a, um, supposedly all the words in the English language on a piece of paper. It's 36 inches by 36 inches. They're not written, this is a detail, they're not written in any particular order. They're scattered throughout as if I took all the words and shook them up. Um, so they're not alphabetically um, in any particular order. Um, I was also, with this piece, thinking about um, the, the reference to minimalism that my, uh, because of the geometry that I was dealing with, and taking it from the opposite extreme of rather than um, a, a complete emptiness, thinking about a complete fullness, and how the um, the absolute nature of the the complete language was a, a way of sort of negating all the individual words. This is a photograph of me on the ceiling. Um, the idea for this piece came when I. Uh, I think I saw something about Tibetan monks begging where they would lay face flat on the ground with their hat open at the base of their head for don donations. And the idea of this most base position was interesting to me. So I photo had myself photographed face flat on the ground and then tur turned the photograph upside down. Um, start to think about charts, maps, and diagrams as ways of orienting oneself to the world. Um, this piece actually came from, um, I was watching Star Trek, and one thing I noticed was when the Enterprise always um, uh, came in contact with an alien spaceship, they were always oriented the, with uh, up as up and, and down as down. And I was thinking it would be interesting if they came to a, a spaceship that was upside down to it because, you know, the choice of up and down is, is fairly arbitrary um, when you're in space. Um, so I thought about the um, taking something that was familiar, familiar to me, um, which is a map of the United States, and. I rendered it, this is acrylic paint, press type and ink on paper, um, rendering it uh, with the states um, upside down, but the words right side up. Uh, this is titled Loop and it's made with a, a one pound box of spaghetti, which I, I cooked the spaghetti, um, dried the noodles so they were hard, and then connected the pieces end to end, till finally I connected the end to the beginning, creating a continuous loop. 
And I was thinking about um, the spaghetti as a pun for noodle or brain, as if it's uh, your one's being led through this convoluted line of thought. Um, I always go back and sort of review, um, and this idea of this circular logic um, um, happened with this piece. Um, some of, sometimes the circular logic is more um, evident, and with this piece, which is the uh, self-portrait carved out of an aspirin, and it's about that size. The idea of the, the aspirin and the head the process of the, the squinting and the headache created by that type of squinting and also on the part of the viewer. Um, that, uh, that led me to think about pills and um, I, I think about art as um, similar to a pill, that it's something that a pill has an appearance and you look at it, but its meaning isn't, isn't so much in its appearance, but in the consumption of it, what it, its physiological effects it has on you. And I see art as a, um, in a similar way as some type of catalyst. Uh, I made this pill. It's a gelatin pill capsule that I filled with tiny balls of Play-Doh. It's about that size. This is made out of uh, a lot of toothpicks. Um, th this piece was presented initially um, in the, the same room as the, um, the Play-Doh pill. And I saw them sort of responding to each other as the pill being some sort of catalyst for this. When the piece of, uh, that I did with the speck of feces was in a show, uh, the curator had to put a cup over it because a fly was buzzing around it they took a photograph they took a photograph of this and sent it to me which gave me the idea for this piece there's a lot of schmutz on the um on the on the um on the pedestal it's actually there's a fly on the corner um so that i that gave me this idea, which is uh, a fly that I made out of Play-Doh, wire, um, hair, plastic, fuzz, paint. Um, I was, then I started to think about the, the, um, the fly, and it made sense with my work. Um, with respect to the size, um, but I, I liked how it played upon um, what I was doing as uh, I was thinking about like a bug as a, a part, like a bug in a computer program, something that puts a sort of a, a, a kink in the logic. I made another fly that was on the wall. I started to think about fantasy, and um, when I make these shifts in thinking of one thing to another, I usually do diagrams that somehow describe that for me. Um, the following drawing began like this with a dot and um, uh, vectors connecting the dots, which would connect more dots. Um, which turned into this. When I was working on that piece, a spider, I, in, in my studio, a spider planted itself on the wall next to it. 
and it just stayed there, and I was at a point of sitting back and thinking about my work. Um, and the spider was just there, and um, I came to the conclusion that I needed to make a spider because it, um, it made so much sense with that drawing, the, the web-like st structure, the idea of spinning web and connecting things. Um, so I made this spider out of Play-Doh, paint, um, fish line, and my hair. This I did on a, um, uh, it, this piece is actually uh, um, the size of a snapshot, like three by five. I wanted it to look like a snapshot from some type of someone's vacation. Um, I, I did this on a computer. I created a clay model, which I superimposed with, onto a uh, um, New England landscape scene. Wanted to unify two ideas of perfection, um, the sphere and then the, um, the bodybuilder. Uh, this is made, I, I blew up a balloon, paper mache over the balloon and then covered it with muscle men cutouts. Um, I, I was thinking about what um, people want to see um, in an art experience, and I thought they want to see themselves in it. Um, they want to see something that they know, something that they can connect to. Um, so I thought about this and the idea of identifying as this very basic process. And, and now that I uh, have a child and, and seeing my son going through the initial stages of language of pointing and identifying, um, and how important that was. So I thought I would sort of take that to an extreme, start to write down all the things that um, um, I felt that I could make out of Play-Doh. Um, this piece is titled Small World, and it's all these things made out of Play-Doh. I was just interested in that basic, um, idea of pointing and identifying. I wanted to unify my process of making a piece of artwork with the viewer's process. And I felt that what we shared, what, what was common, was that we both looked at it. So I did this piece, which is um, titled A Thousand Hours of Staring. Oh. It's hard to see, but it's a, there's a piece of paper right here, just a piece of white paper, um, I, which I, I stared at for a thousand hours. It took me five years to do. Um, this piece is made out of a plastic drinking cup and plastic drinking straws, which I created these loops which cycle through the cup. I got this idea from a, um, a painting by Alex Gray on showing um, the body in, in perfect harmony, showing the energy of the body in perfect harmony. This is an installation shot of a, um, of a show. It's another installation shot. I did this piece, which is a projector uh, that I made out of uh, paper on a paper table. Usually when I make a body of work, I create one of the pieces becomes like a protagonist, something that seems to make things happen. And I, was, I saw this as the protagonist for the particular body of work that this was in, as if it was uh, 
um, creating the, um, these apparitions. Um, this was uh, in that body of work. Um, this is made with $36 um, using this uh, system um, of, of cutting. I would cut the dollar bills up in a certain way in, into, these, into squares um, and reconfigure them. Um, it has something to do with matrices. It's another piece using that system. Um, using nine total cereal boxes. This is made out of hard insulation, which I cut and into square dowels that i um, creating this network, which is uh, um, confined to a cube. Um, this, uh, the idea for this piece came from, uh, there are several things co all coming together, one of which was that um, I became a father and um, the idea of my mortality became um, something that, I, I never really thought about my mortality until I had a son. Um, so thinking about that, but also th this piece is made with construction paper. Um, I had been working with construction paper. I haven't really, I haven't shown any slides of those particular pieces um, where I would um, really explore the possibilities of building with construction paper. And I had been building more geometrically. Um, so this was uh, uh, the idea of building with it um, more biological, more organic was interesting to me. Um, also, I, I, I tend to always look for um, different textures um, when I'm working, something that can contrast what I've been doing before. I like the way different textures contrast each other. Um, for example, like that versus that, and how they both relate and are, are very different. I'm, I'm very interested in the, the connections between the pieces. How um, I, I try to create pieces that are as disparate as possible so that they can have a singularity and specificity to them, but also um, when things are very different, you look for connections between them and, and allowing those connections to be a more conceptual connection. It's another shot. Um, I've been, I, I, uh, in a lot of pieces, I, um, the figure that I use is my own. Um, I don't really think of, of it so much as my own, but I, I use myself. And, um, the the figures that I create, I I, I see as a, as creating some type of presence, um, and uh, and it how that presence becomes sort of a psychological um, ingredient to the body of work. This is made with uh, wooden sticks, um, and their intersections are confined to my to the body shell. and it's suspended about 12 inches off the ground. Um, I made a, a swarm of bees. These are four of them. I um, made about 100 bees. And I was thinking of bees as a, a play on the, the idea of to be. I've been looking for ways of um, creating situations that allow a very open language, an open way of working. Um, 
in this particular piece, which is um, I think of as a mandala, it's uh, um, it, it's kind of as if, as if uh, over all the years I hadn't cleaned up my studio and I swept it up into this pile. So there are all these pieces that um, uh, reference previous um, works that I've done. And in the very center, which is, very, it's, which is hard to see, there's a, um, a, light, a tiny light bulb that's lit, um, which is um, energized by a battery. Um, these are some more recent pieces. Uh, this is a, a sleeve of styrofoam cups. The bottom one's the actual cup, and they get consecutively darker. The top one's black. This piece is titled There, and it's made out of paper. Uh, I made a bunch of gravel um, out of clay. Um, this is uh, taking the process that I made, the dollar bill and the total cereal box, the opposite way. I took one Lucky Charms box, cut it up into, the squ into squares, and made four boxes from the one. This is made out of plastic, and it's, uh, um, it's sort of a response to Brancusi's Sleeping Muse. Um, it's uh, sort of the, that inside out. Another bug, a uh, tarantula that I made out of my hair. And this is another bee piece, which is uh, um, a bee unbecoming. Um, it begins with a, a, a fully made bee, and then I show each cons each process of of um, you start from the from the right. Um, well, so each step in the process of making a bee, all the way down to the um, balls. So that's uh, my work. There are lots of ways in, but I'll start with one simple one. Um, the the piece that Tom showed of the of the fly on the cube uh, was a piece that uh, we acquired for the modern, and uh, Kirk Varnado featured it in the I think the third section of the millennial shows right. that, that were done, and, and he put it in the catalog, and and sent the catalog off to the printer. And uh, the printer looked at it and thought that there was something wrong with the photograph, um, and there must have been some kind of schmutz that got into the into the negative. And so they uh, proceeded to airbrush out the fly. Um, at which point Kirk had to call them up and tell them to not, you know, get the fly back in there. Um, anyway, that goes by way of illustration that to a certain extent. Uh, some of this work is based, if you will, on the expectation of one kind of module or one kind of paradigm and then moves away from it in some direction. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit, you, you mentioned minimalism as, a, as a, an issue. Um, there is conceptualism in particular. I was thinking perhaps of um, Solowitz's Sentences for Conceptual Art and so on. To what extent did you find your way to the same territory or did you consciously think about pushing off from the kind of work that had been done, you know, in, in the 60s and 70s, how how does this operate? Well, I, I think it's uh, I approach it uh, I, I approach my work um, um, not so much from thinking about um, these these movements and and responding to them. 
I think of them more as ingredients. And um, I, I, I think I came to what I do just from um, sort of looking at what I do as, as uh, naturally and logically as I can. And um, I think that <clears throat> by looking at art history and, and uh, um, looking at the, the various movements that my work um, references, um, I, I tend to become interested in, I, I'll become interested in and I'll sort of assimilate um, what exactly is going on there. I, not, not from an from a aesthetic point of view, but really from, um, I, I really think that you know, a lot of the ideas that, um, that these um, movements have really can, can come down to something very basic. And, and they, uh, they didn't begin initially with language in, in my mind. They, they began with a, a type of um, perception. And um, I try to sort of assimilate that perception and it just sort of goes through me and then comes out in this way that I think and work. Um, how, how, and this probably varies, but I mean, how clear in your mind is the image with which you're likely to end up, or how much is it a sense of putting certain processes and materials into motion with a with a sense of roughly where you might be, but really not in much detail? It's it's hard to say because it 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 varies. I usually um, begin with an idea that I then represent um, with a symbol, and um, I sort of live with that symbol, and that symbol becomes this receptacle for all my thinking surrounding this particular piece. And um, then I'll start working on it, but it's, even though my work seems to um, be so deliberate, it, it never ends up with where I thought it, thought it would. And um, I, I um, when it when it surprises me, I think that's when I'm um, that's when I like it. Um, if it, if I had this image um, of what it will look like and it turns out that way, I'm usually bored with it. Mm. When 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 you're you're working, I mean these are incredibly labor intensive individual projects. Are you essentially preoccupied boy one at a time? Do you work at them intermittently? I mean, you did say you teased at the, the, the pillow out for five years, so that right. must be one example. But I mean, is your, is, is, is your inclination to follow through on a single program, or do you keep several pots cooking? It's, it's changed. It, initially, it was because I was interested in that singularity. It was that one piece that just became my focal point. Um, and, <clears throat> Over the years, I uh, um, have come to conceive of a total body of work um, at, at a time, and, and I'm always revising that totality and having to, um, so I'm working on many things at, at, uh, at the same time. I'll, I'll work on a particular piece and take it to a point where I feel comfortable then work on something else, take it to a point where I feel comfortable, and eventually I'll come back to that so that the pieces will um, um, inform each other. Do you think in terms of, of the expenditure of time and, and the, the, the quality of concentration as a demand of sorts or a, a challenge of sorts to the viewer? I mean, is that part of the content per se? or? Um... Well, the, the, the labor and the... the the focus was a, a way to um, um, draw someone into this world. It was a, a way of um, <clears throat> like compressing time in a sense, um, um, a way of <clears throat> like if I'm going to spend this much time on something like this, <laughs> um, you know, the, uh, 
um, someone can spend some time looking at it. Um, there is, well, when, I, when I go and, and do crits in art schools and when I was in art school, one of the worst things that could be said during a certain period of time was that something was precious. Um, mm -hmm. in, Applying, you know, fussy, um, overly aestheticized, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it seems like your stuff flies directly in the face of that kind <laughs> of charge because they're not, in my view. But are, are, are you after deliberately a certain kind of exquisiteness or is that simply a quality that, that attaches itself to the work because the way it's made has to be that way? Yeah, it's, uh, I, I think that the, um, the, my interest in the initially the the precision and um, um, the the craft that was in um, that's involved I, I think that played also off of the um, the materials that um, I think if they were more traditional materials i wouldn't have i, I wouldn't get away with um, that the type of um, um, precision and, and exquisiteness or, or whatever that um, they communicate. Um, but the fact that they're the, these uh, um, materials that you wouldn't consider to have this focal point and giving them that focal point it, that allows, um, you know, and so it, it, it's a very clear strategy of, of um, um, trying to elevate these materials, trying to breathe meaning into them, um, and uh, to take them from this peripheral fo focus to uh, a more central focus. What do you mean by "wouldn't get away from"? Who's who's or get away with? Excuse me. Who's the censor out there who's uh, well, scolding? Uh, no, I, I, I well, I, I think about. Um, um, I think I, for a while I was thinking about uh, the justifiable object, like what sort of in the, in the scope of, of the um, artist and the viewer, what justifies one looking at something and w what allows one to enter into looking and thinking about something. Um, so I'm interested in that exchange between the viewer and this object. Um, and putting myself in the position of the of the viewer and and being sort of its worst critic in, in a sense um, and uh, um, and thinking about what would justify me spending time looking and thinking about something and I, I it might not be something that um, um, artists tend to do but it's something that um, because I'm, I'm dealing with some sort of um, um, breakdown in the, that system of exchange between the viewer and the object. Breakdown, meaning exactly what? Um, the, just ha what, what a viewer um, goes through, what, what are the, what is that exchange between um, the, you know, the, the the breakdown being that um, that questionnaire that I created, okay. that being sort okay. of one, one example of it. What about the, the, the relation of the viewer and, 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 and the object in terms of just physical size and material presence? I mean, mm -hmm. many of these things are relatively small. If not small, they're often made of small things. Right. Um, and, you know, there, there, there were the old arguments about the sort of the implicit body uh, of minimal art, you know, you stand next to a Richard Serra wall of steel, and you you're aware of your own body in particular ways. Is this an, also an integral part of making them the way you do and the scales that you use? Yeah, um, I think about sort of a mutual relationship. Um, in the the scale tends to be sort of body size. Uh, um, it's sort of evolved. Um, it's changed now, but um, initially the, the scale was important that it um, established more of a mutual um, exchange. Um, as things got smaller, I was interested in how it drew one into 
its world that it occupied. It would change it from occupying a real space to this sort of fantasy space, to one of ideas. But they remain, I mean, they remain very delicate, very present. If you hang something from a ceiling or put something on a wall or whatever, the viewer is immediately, in a sense, conscious of their relative clumsiness, at least I am. Right. Um, so the, 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 you know, they, they, they make rather explicit demands or um, pose certain kinds of challenges by understatement or something of that kind. Uh, is that, that's... Uh, d yeah, definitely. Um, well, the, the, the understatement, the... Um, 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 yeah, the, the understatement um, being something that it's uh, um, it's not it, it's not in your face. It's it's something there. If you um, care to enter into it, um, y you can. Um, it's not um, trying to be um, sort of overt in a way. But. Um. If in, in some cases, you represent your own body in more or less scale, or you represent an object like the film projector, which is in more or less natural scale. But how does this operate when, for example, you made a, a member of the piece at the Modern, which was a kind of a, 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 a collection of dust in a ball right. around which was a, a sort of an aureole of dust as well? Right. Is that a thing for the eye, or is that a thing for the eye carried by the body that? Um, has to somehow come to terms with is is what for the eye is that is that an image primarily for the eye or is that something where the very dynamics of seeing something small but thinking something big and then you as is is the the body carrying the eye or in between the two extremes is that that part of what's i mean maybe i'm not making sense anymore. no i i i think i know what you're you're saying that um well i think that that's part of just the um I mean, with that particular piece, the um, the dust creates this environment for that um, dust ball, and um, it um, changes the scale of it in a in a certain way. Um, are, are you talking? You, a, sort of, you sort of think Mars, but you see dust ball. Right. And and, and right. in relation to Mars, it's vast in relation to you it's something that could be sneezed away practically right right well uh, um yeah that's something that um it's interesting a lot of people see I, I i a lot of people mention sort of the scale that it it changes and and um i don't know i i i i tend not to see that for maybe i'm too close to them to to see that um to see that sort of scale shift I probably look at them too long or something. Well, another thing that's, that's, that's you emphasize more than I uh, heard before and is something that's implicit. Here, here are all these things that are beautifully, beautifully made, um, very fragile physically, many of them, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And yet there are images which are extremely violent. Um, <laughs> there are images which are extremely visceral and so on. And it's like, as if you've coded into this very quiet language all the kind of extreme things one can possibly think of. Yeah. Um, that's the opposite of what one sees a great deal of, where thing, loud things are said in a loud voice. Is this a deliberate way of... Well, I, I, I tend to, um, when I try to um, sort of push my understanding of something, I look at where I am and I tend to look at sort of the opposite, um, the, the, the antithesis of that as a way of um, sort of expanding my knowledge or, or my understanding. And uh, um, that sort of violence and sort of vis visceralness um, um, came from that sort of thinking of that e exact opposite of what I am expected that I'm doing. And I think that it's interesting when you sort of find that antithesis that um, it, it makes sense, it sort of redefines itself and it becomes a, a part of the, the whole. Um, it's not 
it, it doesn't seem separate. Um, plus, I, I think it's kind of my heavy metal days sort of coming, <laughs> coming, uh, coming out or something. What were those like? I would like to know. <laughs> Because I mean, you worked in Chicago, where there's a there was a very funky kind of aggressive sensibility, and it may not be there so much as it used to be, but it was for a long time. And when I first saw your work, I sort of I I, I was struck by all of these other qualities. And then when I saw, for example, the splatter piece with your own body made out of out of um, um, car, uh, um, how do you say construction paper, I mean. It's it's this very extreme thing, and yet the craft that makes it is it's like origami, you know, filtered through, you know, um, you know right. a Cronenberg movie or something like that. Uh -huh. And and right. it just seems. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm doing art criticism on stage. I should quit. Um, <laughs> but, um, one other thing I want to ask, which is you don't live in New York, um, and you don't really live in an art capital at all. Um, and what's the relationship? for you of where you live and the kind of work that you do, the, the choice not to sort of be in the midst of all of this or Los Angeles or even Chicago? Well, when I was working in Chicago, I was sort of in the, I, I and coming out of graduate school, I was uh, sort of in the middle of sort of this world of ideas. And um, my, my thinking was very, you know, was was part of that world of ideas, and moving away from that, uh, it sort of took that away, and I had to um, really think about, um, you know, why I was doing this because my environment didn't justify it. It wasn't a part of my environment, so it, it I, I really had to sort of. Um, um, Come to terms with um, questioning what you know. What is the purpose of, of making these things? And, and uh, for myself, was this? A, I mean, you, you you dated in terms of your own, but it was this a particular moment in the art world where there was a, a discourse going on that, that you were directly connected well, to. Well, in Chicago, there was a neo conceptualist movement that was um, happening, and being in graduate school, there was a lot of talk. Um, surrounding those ideas, and I and I, my thinking was um, very much in in line with the 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 things that were happening there. Um, but uh, um, yeah, I, I you know I, I would go through a lot of uh, you know questions about you know why why make these things. And um, I think that I've come to the conclusion that that's a good thing. That because um, um, I I don't know why, but it just seems like a <laughs> good thing to sort of question. And in that context, and then I'm going to open up to the house. But in at least in 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 many areas of conceptual work, the work itself is done by delegation. Um, somebody fabricates it or makes it by a process, or it's explicit in a way that for the idea to be good, the, 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 the object itself has to be as stripped down and, and as unartificed as can possibly be. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, you've introduced, reintroduced the question of a certain kind of manual mastery to a, a, an area where that was really almost anathema. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, right. did you? Think of that as, in sense, uh, as a, simply an alternative, or as a kind of oppositional position. Well, it's uh, just something that I um, ha that happened, and b becoming aware of that as a um, as sort of an opposition to it, but not making, um, not doing it as an opposition. So my my intent wasn't as an opposition, but it it happened. And the way I tend to um, things happen is they happen, and I think about them, and like, oh, I, I understand how that's uh, um, um, how that fits in, or how that is a reaction to. Um, it's it's, uh, and then I direct that. Um, so I'm I'm aware of it, but um, I I tend not to come to it from an intention. 
Okay. Maybe if we can bring the house lights just a little bit so I can see hands that are raised. And um, as usual, I'll repeat a question only if I think people in the back haven't heard it. So let's start with the first hand there. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's, um, I don't know, I, I, it's, it's usually, uh, um, cause I, I, I don't really approach things from, from, I, I guess my answer is no, there, there hasn't really been, um, something like that. It, it tends that if, if, there is a, um, an, a, a large amount of labor. I figure out a way of lessening that. Um, but it also has to do with a certain time. I, I, um, I'm trying to think of an example, like if the pile of string, um, like th thinking of, uh, you know, what if that was, um, um, you know, 10 times as big or, or 20 times as big and it was uh, as two stories tall versus this, the scale that it is. I think that, um, uh, I don't really think that way. Um, it, it seems like there's a certain point at which it, the, it communicates the idea. Um, just one borough back, yeah, please. Yeah, that's I, I do all the work. Yeah. What is your rule? What is your state of mind when you're doing this very close repetitive kind of work? Um, I think about what I I think about all sorts of things. What I what I'm gonna have for dinner, what um, um, I think about the, the I meditate on the piece. What, what what the piece means, what it will mean. Um, I get bored, um, all sorts of things. It's it's uh, it has sort of this uh, sense of a meditative aspect, but many things go through my head. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess so. I think the humor is uh, more of a byproduct of, of um, um, more of a byproduct of it than, than trying to make something funny. I think that there's something about humor. Um, I, um, humor in, in a, defined a certain way as an overview. Um, and uh, um, with that respect, I, I, um, I think of it that way, seeing two sides of a situation or the, the absurdity of a situation. Is that something that develops as, as the piece kind of um, it's, it's sort of with me through, through the entire piece. Uh, it, because I'm not working towards this sort of humorous ends. It's just, it sort of, uh, it just happens. Yes, please. Um, yeah, go. <laughs> I, I see it as uh, coming from play. Um, I, my, my son is a big player. He, he loves to play and, and um, 